2, Dialogue 1. Looking at a family photo. Buying guy. Over one billion people in the world speak Mandarin Chinese. What? <laughs> hold on, hold on. But I'm not one of them. Now, at 30 years old, I'm learning Chinese for the very first time and unpacking why I never learned it in the first place. Sure. Oh, it's just sure. Okay. Lesson two, dialogue two, asking about someone's family. I mean, one thing we need to do is take our shoes off. What kind of Asians have shoes on in the house? You have to take your shoes off, Dad. I always wear shoes. So, yeah, this is a conversation I've actually wanted to have with you for a long time. Good. That is an understatement. I've wanted to ask my dad about our language for a lifetime. Yes, my name is uh, Christopher Kwong. I'm 62. I was born in New York City. Growing up, Dad remembers tagging alongside his grandmothers as they did the shopping in Chinatown. I just get, went into fish markets, meat markets, vegetable markets. Surrounded by people conversing and bartering and going about their day in Chinese. It was the only thing I understood. In a, in a, in a world of, uh, of uh, non-Chinese, when I was outside, it was anxiety and confusion and not knowing what was really being said and just clinging a little harder. But when you hear your native language, it's a reminder of you're safe. But here's the thing. My father stopped speaking Mandarin when he was five years old. He was in kindergarten and really struggling to communicate with his teacher, with his classmates, using the little English that he knew. And his parents, my grandparents, didn't want him to fall behind in school. So they basically stopped speaking Chinese to me. Uh, and everything I was then given, you know, orders to start speaking English for my own survival, emotional and social survival. So that's how it started. And I, start, I didn't hear Chinese again. The transition to English was difficult. He struggled with the vowels. He says his mom, my grandma Hui, spent hours drilling him, and he didn't feel like he had a choice. I realized I had to engage in, uh, in a different world, a uh, world of English, so you know, I should just be pragmatic and let go and go with English. Yeah, that's a big decision for a little kid to make, you know? Well, my need for, I felt for survival was uh, greater than my uh, hurt. <laughs> yeah. When you say need for survival, what do you mean? Meaning to, to integrate into society. Mm -hmm. You have to integrate, otherwise you're, you're, you know, you're going to be really in a terrible place. I get what he's saying, but assimilation has a cost. Gaining a foothold in America meant losing the first language my dad's ever known. When you lose a, your language, you're, you're, it's a, almost a form of violence if it's taken from you, right? Amelia Sang is a sociolinguist at American University, someone who studies how languages shift across immigrant generations. You know, we're a very multilingual country and always have been, very, very diverse country, um, but we are, have not historically been supportive of other languages, um, either through sort of active suppression or through just sort of a lack of interest in supporting them. And Amelia says that lack of support is rooted in things like nationalism and xenophobia. It has caused some linguists to call the U.S. a language graveyard. So that's why I'm learning Chinese. Emily. At least I'm trying to. Please don't come for my tone. I know it's wrong. And I've decided that any shame I might feel about imperfect pronunciation, fumbles with grammar, is nothing compared to the shame I've felt about not knowing the language at all. The shame I feel as my older relatives rattle off dim sum dishes and I stare down the menu pictures, feeling like a fraud within my own identity, missing something I never had in the first place. Meanwhile, my dad isn't as sentimental about this as I am. When I say something like, um, wo I ni, I love you, does that, do you internalize that sentence? If I were to say, dad, I love you in English, in Chinese I'd say, ba ba, wo I ni. Well, it, 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 in English, of course, it resonates Chinese. It's like Emily, my, my regist I registered Emily's learning Chinese. Sure. 
One is it's just an obje objective observation. Hmm. Maybe if I get better at the pronunciation one day, it will like... Well, our, our words will always be English, Emily. This is my mother... But English doesn't tell the whole truth about us, where we come from, and I'm tired of hiding it. When I think about people who have been targeted this past year just because they have an Asian face or speak an Asian language just makes me want to speak Chinese more. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. It's like, we're here. We, our culture can't be intimidated. I think the, um, the key is to meet challenges, um, stare down adversity, confront intimidation, and uh, to always uh, strive for the truth. I think if you strive for the truth, you've um, lived life, regardless of you know what price you pay. Yeah. In the group chat. My birth certificate doesn't tell the truth. It says I'm white even though my father was standing right there in the delivery room. And this erasure of him, of who I fully am and the language of his family, really hurts. It's left me with a feeling that I'm not Chinese enough. Amelia, the sociolinguist, says there's a word for this, racial imposter syndrome. And moving through it requires flexibility, self-compassion, and reimagining what it means to be Chinese in America, our identities is something dynamic, not a box you check on a form. Part of how we create it is through language, the languages we speak, who we talk to, but also how we talk about ourselves and other people. Some of my earliest memories are of my dad's mom, my grandma Hui, trying to teach me Chinese in the years before she and my grandfather died. And I find it kind of beautiful that my grandmother, the same person who taught my father English so he could survive in her last years, was teaching me Chinese so it could survive within me. It feels like a language that's ours. It, it belongs to our family. And I can engage with it if I want to and as much as I want to. It is who we are, so we have to cling or retain or perhaps relearn what we are. So I think, you know, this, this is a, a journey of exploration for you and this is so you can tie back to what you, where you came from. <laughs> that means a lot to hear you say that. Well, the cameras do magic things for you. <laughs> You almost had me. <laughs> Learning a language is like building a bridge. You don't know if your attempt to communicate will get you to the other side. But I know in this moment I got through to my dad and that he heard me. And that's all the permission I need to keep learning this language for the rest of my life. I think that means are your parents from China? No. <laughs> 